here we are with uh, Daniele Giardini. And Hello. Today we try, we want to talk about the balance flow of storytelling in, in games. And this is a theme which uh, Daniele proposed, and so I'm uh, giving you the power and tell us something about it. Uh, I was actually, uh, we were talking about what to discuss about, and the balance of uh, storytelling is a thing that uh, I'm, uh, I've always been interested, uh, because it's uh, uh, one of those things that are very important, uh, uh, but uh, they're very hard to get uh, to not only they're very hard to uh, to be done well, but most often in games uh, there's not the there's a voluntary choice not to do it uh, well because it implies a lot of other means and uh, and stuff. And for example, I was thinking uh, right now I'm playing uh, Witcher 3 because I have a new computer. Yeah, uh, and uh, I was thinking about when I played Witcher 2 which is considered uh, a great game with uh, a, uh, it's a fantasy game but with a more adult approach to storytelling which is uh, very good and lovely but it has uh, big problems with the flow of the story because for example it's divided in chapters so within each chapter the story flows uh, with uh, a more or less uniform pace uh, which is the easiest way to keep the flow of a story but it's not the only way and, uh, but between each chapter, instead, there's like uh, a sudden cut and you're like uh, teleported into some new area of the world uh, with new events, uh, political events, social events, uh, personal events that uh, kind of happen in the background. But it's not one of those, uh, oh, things happened and that's, uh, uh, we're not telling them to you because uh, it's actually part of the storytelling and how we want to involve you as a player. But it's just a way to cut. Uh, part of the flow, which I find very bad, and that's often often in games this happens both during the game and especially uh, this is considered one of the greatest greatest defects of games, uh, especially at the end, where the ending of a game is uh, most often cut very short. Uh, and there was once I don't remember who uh, uh, what uh, publisher of uh, AAA games who was actually explaining why they cut the end of the game because they prefer to put all their money in the game itself. <laughs> Especially in the beginning because the beginning is where people get involved into it and attached to it. So they have to cut somewhere and they cut the end. But uh, if you think about movies or books or whatever, if you read a magnificent book or watch a magnificent movie, if the ending sucks, the whole experience is ruined. Yeah. So that's something, I mean, it shouldn't even be considered as a possibility, the idea of cutting the end of something or cutting the flow. And uh, that's what kind of uh, uh, annoys me about <laughs> most games. But this was The Witcher 2 or The Witcher 3? The Witcher 2 has, uh, uh, was one of those cases which instead are uh, less, are more rare, where the flow was cut in between the game, other than in the end. Or actually, I never finished it, so I don't know if the end was cut or not. Mm. But there was this in-game flow cuts. And I mean, the flow of storytelling is always, it's not a, a regular thing. It doesn't need to be uniform. It's actually very, it can be, it's like an elastic. It can be played, it's like a wave. You can uh, mm. uh, use different heights, different waves, different... Uh, you have moments uh, where the story flows more deeply and more intensely, others where it flows uh, uh, in a more calm way, and that's all beautiful if you know how to control the flow with all its edges and roughs. Uh, but uh, when you just cut it, you I mean, if we're talking about a, a rope, <laughs> you, you just cut the rope and there's no way to mend it. Mm. You ruin the, the whole experience. Well, yeah. Uh, well, it, it, in one of the things that Kahneman points out uh, is that uh, it's one of the way our mind works is that in an experience, what we most remember is the ending. Exactly. So even if the experience has been wonderful, if the ending is bad, uh, that will spoil everything, as you said. But that seems to be a really basic way of uh, our remembering and rebuilding, uh, reconstructing the experiences we had. So, 
probably yeah. in games having a good ending uh, could be a very a good idea. Yeah, it's very. Imp- I mean, even in relationships, uh, most often people when a relationship ends badly, they remember the whole relationship as being something horrible. Well, they're, they're not even capable of understanding that it's not. And when we're talking about things that in theory are more simpler than a relationship, uh, the, the, the rough ending becomes something that is even more epic. Like there is really, it's not that you can come back to it after two years and think, oh yeah, but it was good after all. It is ruined forever in my opinion. <laughs> so, <laughs> and it's something very basic as uh, you and Kahneman correctly say. Well, so, well, would you, would, and does any example come to your mind about games with a, with a nicely crafted endings? There is uh, the main example for me of a, a wonderful ending and how it should be done, which is Bioshock Infinite, where actually the same developer made, uh, which is Irrational Games, uh, uh, with Bioshock 1, they made the big mistake of ending it too quickly. Actually, apparently, they didn't even add the movie at the end, which they didn't want to add. They wanted to end it differently, but for but their publisher forced them to do that, so I have no idea what they originally had in mind. But the, the whole experience of Bioshock 1 was pretty ruined by being a, a very deep story with a, a five-second ending or something like that. Mm. With Bioshock Infinite, instead... Uh, the story is beautiful as it was in Bioshock 1 but then they chose also to uh, practically the, the last level and the last, which is a very long level of the game is the ending and then there are flashbacks and there's a lot of stuff happening and the ending lasts like an hour and it's a full hour of uh, intense storytelling it's not useless for example I could think of an opposite example which is uh, uh, the, the Lord of the Rings movies, uh, mm. where the final movie has a, a very long ending, which is completely unnecessary in this. <laughs> it becomes just boring. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, well, mm, as you as you dangerously made this um, this uh, parallel between games and movies, now. Mm, we know that in games storytelling, uh, there are many ways to express, uh, to make the player go through a story, and um, so which are which are ways which you find work, and uh, ways to express stories in games, and ways that don't work. I have to say that, as usual, I believe that if something is well done, everything works. <laughs> so even if you go with the easiest and most classic uh, uh, slash banal way, which is to just tell a story, if it's told beautifully, it will work. But there are other much more fascinating ways which add a lot, of, a lot more depth, so where, for example, in Bioshock, uh, this story is not clear. Uh, you learn something while you play, and then you discovered pieces of information in, uh, in recordings that are lying around. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, you kind of create your own story. I mean, after... Uh, like Gone Home. Like Gone Home, which I didn't play, so I have to admit. But I, I from what I read, yes, kind of like that. So Gone Home has a specific... Uh, after you play it all, if I'm, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, it reveals its story fully. Yes, but it's one... Yes, exactly. Yes, Bioshock Infinite is, is what I consider the most deep story ever told in games, personally, because it doesn't reveal it totally fully. It doesn't keep secrets from you. It just leaves it open to your interpretation in a very smart way. Mm. Because, for example, after it came out, I think, uh, two years ago, and after two years, there's still a lot of people debating online what the ending truly means, uh, with all the uh, hints they found... Uh, and uh, even if the ending is very powerful and it's very strong, uh, it still leaves space to interpretation, which is very beautiful. Mm-hmm. Uh, otherwise, there are, for example, Dark Souls. Dark Souls is totally absurd in the way it tells a story, and it's beautiful even there. Like, the story is actually not told. You find, uh, when you find uh, an object that you place in your inventory, that object, as usual in RPG games, has a description. 
And by reading the descriptions, you learn, for example, that uh, that sack was, uh, belonged to uh, King Gino the First, uh, and that he killed uh, his mother, and then you find another piece of object which is related to the mother, mother of King Gino the First, and you have to combine all these pieces of information, and it's hyper complicated, and you will never manage to do it by yourself unless you like that zero. 0.0001% of uh, players, but you will need some internet help, but still it adds so much to the, to the game. It also depends on what kind of story you want to tell, mm-hmm. obviously. Mm-hmm. Well, and um, now bringing it uh, to simpler contexts, like in, in more indie games and uh, more, more mobile games, um, there are some interesting examples of storytelling there too, which is also a field I'm more familiar with. Uh, you, did you play 80 Days? I started it, but I, I kind of have problems in the end playing mobile games, but that is very interesting too. Mm, because there, the, I find the, the, even, even in a very traditional and let's say, a bit uh, tainted <laughs> and a bit worn out uh, multiple choice uh, way of, of going through a story actually they they, they they managed to to give new solutions to an old uh, genre and the well-known mechanics and I yeah. to me it, it it actually it works quite well it's also linked to to character building that is that the way the stories and characters it's a, it's an important uh, relationship, and uh, there that the fact that you are the servant, that you have this perspective, uh, some humor also, mm-hmm. and uh, the, the the overall story is very well written, and yeah. um, so there there I think it's very interesting because they show how very traditional mechanics and storytelling can work in a casual, not casual, in a mobile. <laughs> In a mobile, <laughs> simple game. Yeah. Another very interesting thing about 80 Days that I found is that uh, there's not only the fact that it tries to take a new approach to storytelling, but, but after all, it's uh, it's an IF interactive fiction. Yeah. Where and there are tons of interactive fictions, but it takes also a, a different graphical and usability-wise approach to yeah. it. Like it doesn't show you one page of text and then you have a choice. Like also most uh, most twine games do. It shows you just a little and then either you have a choice or you just have to click to continue and uh, that makes it much more manageable because uh, even if I just see four, uh, four rows of text instead than 20 and then I have to click four times, actually five, to see it all, uh, it, it, the, the experience that you get from it is uh, it's much less wall of text. Yeah, yeah. The way yeah. they merged, the, the way they use the UI, the way they define it yeah. is interesting. And also the way they they somehow they merge the scenes one with the other, and the maps, and the movement, and the trains. It's it's the overall thing that makes uh, that makes it go beyond the, the the classical read text and click next. Exactly. For example, yeah. I mean from personal experience. If I play a pure IF interactive fiction, which is pure text, I have no problems with wall of text. But when I play a game that also has a graphic part, for ex- like for example 80 days, if I see a wall of text, I start getting anxious because it's like it's two things that are not very compatible with each other in my opinion. There is, uh, I, I can think about, uh, uh, how is it called? There was an RPG games Shadowrun. Mm-hmm. Shadowrun is uh, an RPG game where there are there's a lot of text very well written and but each time I saw their text uh, a lot of times it was very long and I kind of got anxious because uh, I'm not there to I'm I'm playing a game I'm not there to really stop and read a lot not because I don't like reading because I love reading but because in that context context it kind of breaks the flow well, you know, you know, uh, way, yeah. 
Yeah, I think I think this is something they talk about the guys who did it is in, in the sense it's built in such a way that you can play the five minutes you're waiting for the bus and and somehow you have enough information when you get back that you can play another five day five minutes but uh, the, the, the key word you said before is the anxious part. So, in the sense, you don't have to manage and deal uh, with so much information to go on. And uh, it's, it's sort of self-contained each time you play. So, yeah. So, I think that's why it works. And, and why uh, it's, it's, it's actually linked to the way you use your phone. Uh, your smartphone is, is used for brief brief intervals so you have to think about that so even the technology you're using can influence the way you do the storytelling true well in this in this line another <laughs> i think positive example uh is is kardashian hollywood which of course you played a lot I'm sure <laughs> i i was sure you would mention sunless scene now instead you went with <laughs> kardashian <laughs> <laughs> to bring down the whole plot, uh, but actually I'm not because it's a very well written and designed game. I yeah. know, I know you love it. Uh. <laughs> no, I love it, but I I love to bring it up with the snobbish indie game designers. <laughs> and um, there again, the, the 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 I think the strongest point is is this, their sensitivity to rhythm. The sensitivity to rhythm, the rhythm. Oh, so, the rhythm, yeah. Yeah, that's 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 what the, it's really well done. I think for my taste, it's the only thing that's really well done. <laughs> and um, but they managed to to do some to to make a game which is which has a lot to lot of stuff to read, and many choices to make to make text based. So in a way, not that friendly for casual, for very very casual gamers, which is their target. But the rhythm with which they, they manage to structure the gameplay uh, makes it, may, I think, uh, it's compatible with a low, very low attention uh, span. Mm. <laughs> and uh, so that's, that's, that's why it, it works. Okay, I will have to play it, so next time we can <laughs> talk more about it. I'm not sure it's, it's that important, anyway. And, uh, well, Sunless Sea, let's talk about Sunless Sea. Let's talk about Sunless Sea. Oh, that is your area of expertise. Huh? You, well, Sunless Sea is, is such a beautiful game, and um, there again, like in 80 Days, there's a link between the story and how you play the game. That is the like the rhythm of the boat, uh, which is slow and so so rhythmic again, mm. and uh, the way you go around and you steer slowly between these monsters that sometimes kill you and sometimes most time they don't, but and uh, the monsters too move very slowly, and this sort of prepares you to this to this bizarre. Uh, experiences that you have in the different islands and meeting the tr tribes of rats which have their own civilizations and ideas which you can join <laughs> or, or the ghosts yeah. that you meet in another island and it's all it so fits together so well ah, ah, and, and another point is the way it ends ah. oh no don't tell me I didn't finish it yet no 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 but not the way the whole story ends the way the way when you when you die which mm. happens quite frequently, is that is quite curated there. That mm. is quite curated because you can leave a legacy. You can leave a legacy and you in-game you can have a son. If you have a son, or even if you don't, you can leave, if I remember well, you can leave a legacy and there's a little there's a little portrait of yourself <laughs> in the following game and you can leave the boat and your stuff to to the next character you're playing uh, which in a way is again you and so that is very well done and curated and uh, it fits well in this story which is a story which has a story like a little s s an, uh, 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 you're sort of accumulating a story of the world where you're playing. Yeah. 
and uh, that also gives a sensation of depth. Uh, it's very interesting. It's very interesting overall. Actually, I have to think uh, to say now that we were talking about it that an interesting thing about Silent Sea also is that the way stories are told, in, which in a way are told via cards, uh, make yeah. it not only. I mean, uh, conceptually, it's a game where you go around discovering stories. But with the way it's, uh, it's crafted, it's not only that you're discovering stories, you're actually collecting stories, which is mostly a subconscious approach, but it really works well. Yeah, 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 true, true. In fact, you know, uh, in all the examples that come to my mind, there's in games there's a relationship between s in games where storytelling works, there's always a relationship between storytelling and space. And uh, space exploration, there's something there, there's a link there, and um, yeah, which can also be. I mean, the way space is used is very important, it doesn't mean the space must be big or small, it can be a room, and the space can be your mind. But space has definitely an import. I but can I jump a little about this? I was another thing I was talking yesterday with Helena about storytelling and space is that there are some games instead that are, for example, they use space terribly. Like, uh, let's go back to Bioshock a moment. Mm -hmm. Bioshock 1, beautiful story, bad ending, ending. Bioshock Infinite, which is practically Bioshock 3, has a wonderful story, wonderful ending. Bioshock 2 has a terrible flow instead, because whatever you do, like, uh, uh, you need to, okay, go to the Batisphere. You reach the Batisphere and they tell you, no, the door is locked, you have to go get the key on this other place. You go get the key and the key is, uh, you don't find it and you find something that tells you that, oh, this other guy got the key, you have to find the other guy. And so you're actually going round and round the same objective and then you finally manage to reach the main objective that you wanted to reach and you go on and this loop starts again and that's a horrible flow because you're rolling around yourself it doesn't help uh, reading the story it doesn't help enjoying the gameplay it's you loop and loop uh, it's if if flow is a line you practically like creating uh, a line that loops over itself then goes a little forward then loops again over itself goes a little forward mm. and this is not a good flow I always liked to consider flow as a line even when ages ago I was working I was kind of trying to set up a magazine mm -hmm. uh, all the pages were organized uh, with uh, a line that was in, in that case an emotional line of the flow of the whole magazine page by page and uh, how you draw that line is really important. Uh, it's very graphical in a way. <laughs> and also the line must look beautiful, but that's another... <laughs> 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 well, uh, you know, one thing I was thinking about, you know, we were thinking about, uh, we, were, we talked about game feel and giving depth uh, to the game and all the animations, the movements, uh, and so on. And uh, somehow, something similar like uh, like story feel huh? mm. uh, it's something that one could could uh, theorize in the sense look I'll pass you a link if games were like stories mm. he suggests that that it's by working on little details that you can uh, make the story experience much better. My favorite moment from Paper Please was when someone gave me a banner for a sports team named the Rashtoka Arts Kickers. The choice of whether to put it up on my wall or not. Uh, this was a small and silly decision and I put it on my wall of course. But the reason this is so memorable to me is because the game actively acknowledged the small act. A few people commented on the banner, some remarking it's tacky, some cheering, go Ars Kickers! And then, of course, the decision bites me in the ass when the inspector comes by and tells me the decoration is against protocol and finds me. Yeah, that is very interesting. But this, I have to say this is uh, a very good example of how much you can go beyond the simple storytelling. Mm. And uh, as I believe, as usual, uh, a beautiful storytelling by itself can already make a game good. But there are so many ways that you can go beyond that, which usually you don't have in movies or books. Mm. So, you, so you might, uh, in books more easily than in movies, in my opinion. Um, 
you, you really can play with storytelling. I mean, why should, should you just tell a story? In this case, we're talking about the importance uh, of reflecting your own story over the story that has been told. But it yeah. could also, and this is a, a, an active part of the story, but you could also play in billions of ways with the passive side of the story. Mm-hmm. Well, this is what the example we, we've seen here is not about the main story. It's uh, like something you can add uh, in your game and you can add many of these. Mm-hmm. Um, like you know what comes to my mind comes to mind um, Football Legends a little game for, for mm-hmm. iPhone which is extremely successful uh, which is about you leading this uh, and playing by flicking balls on the phone mm-hmm. and uh, there the storytelling is entirely made by little tricks like this the problem with this is that uh, in a game like that where, which, where you play for many many hours the, 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 these kinds of episodes start repeating after a while, and that's a horrible, terrible sensation. Yeah, and um, but that's why these things. <clears throat> I mean, uh, they're kind of procedural because they're tied to your choices, so they must be procedural in a way, unless they're all scripted. Either you really put a lot of content in that, or they should still be a small part of the game. Mm, mm, because mm. otherwise, as you say, they can start becoming very, they can start repeat themselves a lot. Like in procedural games, uh, which after you play a while, everything is the same. Mm, 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 mm. But if you keep it, uh, I mean, it, even the, the procedural part of everything, I don't like it very much because it, it doesn't really have a name. Mm. But if kept as a small part of uh, any possible uh, side of uh, storytelling, gameplay, etc., it can add uh, a lot of depth. Mm. Maybe one could even create a way, like in your case, uh, about Football Manager, where the story is created by what you do, there could be a more random way of creating phrases uh, uh, and uh, eventual events. Uh, well, uh, yeah, what I'm doing in, in my little football drama game is that I'm, I created a random sentence generator from because ah. um, the characters don't need to make sense of what they're saying. They're just expressing mm-hmm. an emotion. So I, I create like random, random uh, sets of words. Uh, and that, I mean, if, if in an overall game that doesn't make much sense, uh, that works very well. <laughs> <laughs> I loved to play with random faces generators. <laughs> it's very fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. well it's probably only for very low quality games that it works. But... No, it, it it's for nonsense games. <laughs> it's interesting how different the problems are in different game genres and different game technology. No. Mm. Uh, but s- still, still, the heart right. of it is that the the story has to be good, and that's very hard. Actually, I disagree on this. Okay. I mean, uh, it's like with everything. I mean, uh, a beautiful story can be told even if this actual story sucks. For example, Dark Souls, which I was mentioning before, where you have to gather pieces of this story. I actually don't know what this story truly is because I didn't understand understood it. I didn't understand it, but the way it's told makes it beautiful to me. <laughs> oh, but that happens. Well, I mean, we're saying in a, in a way, uh, at least my little experience as a writer is exactly this too. In a sense, a good story is not the fact that uh, plot is good. Yeah, you can take a very trivial and predictable plot and make it a very good story. It's the details, it's the sentences, how you write them. It's, exactly. Um, it's uh, like, like my, my short stories on Caesar in Britain. It's, it was, what, what people liked is that in, 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 um, when I shortened the style of the sentences, still they were referring to a big world in which the story was set, of which I knew a lot about the way the, the Celts lived, about the way the, the Roman soldiers uh, kept their weapons, or things like that, just little details. Yeah? But the overall story is, is, 
is uh, very is trivial. It's just a Roman soldier captured by by the Britons, and um, so there again, it's 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 the the depth of the surrounding world and the details that that give you a sensation of a of a good and bad story. Even when you're doing narrative, it's not just for games. Absolutely, I I can think of also of a Barico, which is an Italian writer that you know, I don't know if the rest of the world knows it. Uh, he's very famous, actually. Yeah, but still. Uh, <laughs> I've and, seen uh, him everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I used to love him when I was an adolescent, uh, and he was starting to write, and uh, he has a, a fantastic way of writing. Mm. But um, in his first books, uh, he also had a, an interesting, even if a very banal plot, like he never made some... Uh, um, some great plots, and they were very simple. But with the way he was telling them, uh, the books became actually beautiful. Then he started telling plots that were so ugly that even his own writing style was uninspired. I completely lost my... I loved him, and I completely lost my love of him with City, which he published, I think, 15 years ago. I don't remember anymore. Mm. So, I mean, writing style is important, but even if the writing style... As usual, you can fuck up even if uh, one part is great, uh, because his writing style was always fantastic. Uh, but sometimes you manage to tell something that is, that is so empty that even a deep writing style results uh, in no depth at all. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I did say that the, the world surrounding your style has to have depth in some sense. So. Mm. Um, I think that from this last uh, few, last uh, short discussion, I think if, if you if you're if you want to do storytelling games, there's a lot you can get from this uh, from what we said. Uh, yeah. So I think we could uh, end up with a good ending, as we suggested. See you soon. Okay, that was very nice. See you soon. Ciao. Ciao.